to faith, and that is when God says something that we are to respond to it in obedience, and so today will be a good opportunity for, for us to, to apply that. We're studying the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Since verse 18, we've been talking about what it means to be filled with the Spirit, and that is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit, and, and it has some fruits or some uh, expressions, as verse 20 uh, talks about giving thanks, and uh, verse 19 speaks about singing, and uh, making melody in your heart unto the Lord, joy. Uh, verse 20, giving thanks. And verse 21, submitting ourselves one to another. But then it works in particular areas of our life as well, as in verse 22, uh, uh, the wife is then told to be submissive to her own husband, as the, uh, for the, verse 23 says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to her husband, uh, unto Christ, so let the wife be unto her own husband in everything. Today we pick up in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, and let me read it to the end of the chapter. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it, uh, with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish, so ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bone. For, for, this, uh, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave and be joined unto his wife, and they and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we pray that we would indeed look at this Bible as being the, the way we ought to live. And there's not debating over should we do it or shouldn't we do it. Father, may we realize that you teach us what to do and how to do it. May we be obedient to you for your glory and, and for the riches of our own uh, life here and, and for eternity. We ask it in the Savior's name. Amen. Rich, there's one. Thank you, Rich. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, the verse is obvious that the Bible is telling the husband, and when it talks about the, the loving relationship in the home, it immediately addresses the husband. Uh, but the verse doesn't just tell us, Husbands, love your wives. Yeah, the, the, it's just not a statement that, that we're to do that. The verse tells us to what degree we're to love our wives, and then how we're to express that love. For instance, when it says, husbands love your wives, the, the word love there is that word that sometimes we, we call agape, as we know that the Greek word behind it is an agape love. And that really would tell us the degree of love that we are to love. Uh, if you don't know it by the Greek, all you gotta do is read the verse, husbands love your wives at, even as Christ also loved the church. And so you know the degree of that love is as the, the great love that God had, the great love that Christ had when he gave himself for the church. You know that is a divine love. And therefore we have to be talking about being spirit-filled husbands in this verse. Again, as we said when it addressed the, the wives, that we believe that those verses are written directly to the wife. Uh, the husbands don't have to uh, pound those things in the wife's head. It's God speaking to the wife about those things. And now, the, now God is addressing husbands and speaking directly to us who find ourselves that or to those young men who will someday be husbands who need to know what, what a real husband is in God's sight. And, and when the first thing that he tells us is to love our wife even as Christ also loved the church. My first tendency when I read something like that is to say, well, I can't be doing, done. I can't love to that degree of love. But as we said, we're talking about being spirit-filled husbands, living our life not by the flesh, but by the Spirit of God. And there is a divine spirit in each one who has trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. That divine spirit has some fruits that are told to us in, in Galatians chapter 5 that manifest themselves under those who walk after the Spirit. The very first fruit is love. And that love there is the agape love, this kind of love. 
This kind of love doesn't stem from just being brought up in the world naturally. It doesn't come by, by you just deciding, I'm going to pour out my great love upon my wife. This is the love that God produces inside of a person, and only a Christian man could love his wife this way. Uh, it's beyond any capability of anyone else, and it's not, you're, you're not able to do this kind of loving even in your flesh. This is the kind of love that God has to produce in your heart and then teach you how to love this way. And because we know the Holy Spirit is alive and is in us and uh, is there working in us and, and causing us to, to be more than what we can be in our flesh, then it is, a, it is a possible task. We can love our wives even as Christ loved the church. So that great degree we're to love, but now how do we express that love? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ gave himself for it. That's how he expressed his love, and that's the kind of love that a man is to love his wife as he's to give her se himself for her. Um, when we talked about him loving his wife and, and loving her with the agape love, I know that when Christ gave himself for me, he did not do it because I was so lovely. He did not do it because I was such a wonderful person that he desired by all means to have me in heaven with him. The Bible tells us that God loved us even, that, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were called enemies that he reconciled unto, unto God through the death of the cross. Uh, we were not very lovely whatsoever. There was nothing good in ourselves that caused Jesus Christ to extend love toward us and save us. It was the love that he had in himself that would reach down and love things that were so unlovely that he loved us to that degree and gave himself for us. So immediately we know when a husband is to love his wife, it's not because of her beauty, it's not because of her personality, it's not because of her loving nature, it's not because of her kindness, it's not because of her good cooking, it's not because of her hey, ability to clean house and all of that. A husband is to learn to love his wife in all of her imperfections and love her just as much as God loved us in all of our imperfections and, and never hesitate to give himself for us. So that, that is indeed divine love. But that giving himself for the church, uh, we'll talk more about that as we understand that that speaks about the cross where the Lord Jesus Christ came and, and not only died for the nation of Israel but died for us as well. He died for the sins of the whole world and he's the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. And those who believe come in a special relationship with him that he risked his life and, and died, not risk, but he, he risked this, is for us to make a choice to trust in him or not. And knowing that some would reject him did not stop him from going to the cross and paying for their sins. Just for whatever, whoever will respond in faith, he was glad to have died for them. And, and the Lord risked his love and, and expressed his love and died all for the whole world. But you and I who trusted him as Savior, we become part of him. We are the ones who are joined with him. And we are the ones that, that he'll ultimately save. And so he gave himself for us. When he gave himself for us, one of the things we've got to remember when we talk about husband-wife relationship, it doesn't say that in, in the sense of a husband love his wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that a husband is not to give his, wife, his life himself to his wife. There's a difference in giving yourself for your wife and giving yourself to your wife. See, that'd be idolatry to give yourself to your wife. Doesn't it tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that you are bought with a price and you're not your own? That you're to glorify God in your spirit and your soul which are God's? He's purchased us. We belong to God. And there is no conflict in serving God and being the proper husband to a wife. There's no conflict there. Because the one who we belong to, who owns us, says give your life for your wife. And, and not he didn't say give your life to your wife. You don't become... Uh, she don't become your God, you become her, uh, her, her, the one who's out to live for her, but you're to give yourself for her, uh, to give yourself for her in, in the degree that, uh, that you're there, uh, well, as the Bible says for us. Let's go over to Galatians. Let's just let the Bible say it. Galatians chapter 1. It's just before Ephesians, I flipped too far. Galatians chapter 1, and look at verse 4. This puts some perspective on it. We know that he died on the cross to pay for our sins. 
so that we could be saved and forgiven and reconciled unto God the Father and one with Christ. It says, uh, verse 3, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. There it is. That, oh, here's why, he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. When the Bible says that Christ gave himself for us, it's for a reason, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, If you're to give yourself for your wife, what are you supposed to be giving yourself for? Well, according to these verses, that, 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 uh, that we might be uh, delivered from this present evil world. That you might deliver your wife from this present evil world. You know, when, a, when the Bible talks about the duties of a, the headship of a home and the responsibility of a home, you, you understand that the Bible talks about that a man, if he doesn't provide for his home, is worse than an infidel for his own. He's worse than an infidel. He's worse than an unbeliever. It's a number one responsibility for a husband, or I don't know how to pick number one, I can scratch the one and say, it is a responsibility for the husband to be a provider of the home. And when I think about Christ giving himself for us that he might deliver us from this present evil world, and a husband's to love his wife that he might uh, give himself for her, it is for that same reason, to provide for her and to deliver her from this present evil world. When, a, when, when a, husband, a husband's duty to his wife is to love, as we just saw in the verse, is to love her. If you've got to give your life for her, that means you've got to protect her. And if, if your duty, you're worse than an infill, if you don't provide, then you need to provide for her. So a husband who gives himself for his wife is one who gives his life, bestows his, his, his love upon his wife. He's one that, that is, is giving himself to protect his wife. And he's one who's giving himself to provide for his wife. And that would definitely be being, uh, delivering her from this present evil world so that she doesn't have to fend for herself out there in this evil world. And that's what God calls on a, a believer to do, a Christian man to do by the Spirit of God. I'd like you to come back with me to the Old Testament book of Ruth. Because years ago I discovered that when we talk about a husband's responsibility and what a wife looks for in a husband. They might say something other today, uh, but they don't mean it. And if they mean it, they don't really know what's best for them. When you come back to the book of Ruth, you find out what a woman looked for in a man because Ruth lost her husband. And so did Naomi, who who is the main, uh, the older figure in in this verse. Just before the book of Samuel. Ruth, go to chapter 1. We won't try to cover the whole book, but I do want you to see the book in light of, of, of three widowed women who know what they're missing by losing their husband. Now, it starts out that there is uh, a famine in, in Israel, and, uh, and a man named Elimelech took his wife Naomi and their two sons, and they, they tried to get away from the chastisement of God upon the nation of Israel by moving to the land of Moab, a Gentile land. Well, those two sons, uh, they married two Gentile women of the land of Moab. And it's not, we don't know how much time it is while they're in that delay, why they they moved to Moab, but, but what happens is all three men die. First, Elimelech dies, and then his two sons die, and leaves Naomi, Orpha, and Ruth to be widows. Uh, Naomi being the mother and Orpha and Ruth being her daughter-in-laws, they're now left uh, widowed. And and Naomi hears that that the plague or the the famine is is over in in her homeland, that there's food back there. Without a husband, without relatives around, she decides she's got to go back to Israel. But the other two ladies are from the land of Moab, and so she encourages them to stay. And I'd like you to see what she says to them. Chapter 1, verse 6. It says, Then she arose with her daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard uh, heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his, uh, his people and given them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughter in laws with her, and they went on the way and returned unto the land of Judah. 
And Naomi said unto her daughter, daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as he hath dealt with the dead and w- with me, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband, that her... Uh, that she uh, then she kissed them and lifted up her voice and wept. Notice that I have that circled in my Bible in verse nine, that you might find rest in the house of your husband. They're widows; they need a new husband. When they find a husband, they'll find rest. Until then, go back home. That's where dads take care of daughters by their dad. Dad can take care of them. They'll meet a husband, and the husband is supposed to provide rest, a place for a shelter for their loved ones from the present evil world. It says in verse 13, now look at verse 14. It says, And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and that is, in between, they both insisted, no, they'll stay with their mother-in-law, but, but when it really came down to it, it says, And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth cleaved unto her. And she said unto her, Behold, thy, sister in, uh, behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back into the, unto her people, and unto her gods, return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee, for whether thou goest, I will go. Where thou long, uh, lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Uh, wherefore, didst, uh, where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more, if aught be uh, but death uh, part thee and me. So Orpha kissed her and after the second time and went back home. But then here, uh, Ruth, she claved to her mother-in-law. And what happens in the story of, of Ruth, Ruth becomes there so close that Ruth almost fills the position. They go back, and it's Ruth who goes and gleans in the fields in order to have food to provide for her mother-in-law. Uh, eventually, she gets to eat with the servants of, of a man named Boaz as she's working in his fields. And Boaz, uh, Boaz has an eye on her. What uh, they don't know, what she doesn't know, is that Boaz is a near kinsman. And in Bible days, a kinsman would would marry the the widowed woman in order to bring her into his household to raise up seed for her uh, husband in her husband's name. And uh, and so she's working for Boaz. And but the point is, is that she's taking care of Ruth as as if she was uh, a husband to Ruth, as she was one who filled in in the in the stead of Ruth's son. Uh, who is also dead, along with uh, Naomi's son, as long as, as is dead as well, and doesn't have Naomi the mother doesn't have them to take care of her. Uh, when you come to chapter three of Ruth, it says in verse one, "Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee?" She understands that Boaz has some interest in her. And now she's going to tell her, I'll find you some rest. What she means by that, I'm going to get you a husband. You, you listen to what I say. And what she does is tell her what she has to do to let Boaz know that she is interested in having him redeem her and, uh, unto himself to take under her, uh, him his kinsman right to marry the widow of, of a relative. And so when you read through chapter 3, that's what's happening there. She, she goes through the customs that will let him know that she's interested. And he promises to do so just as long as one other relative doesn't want to marry her first. And then we go through that process where that other relative denies the, that responsibility, de, de, declines to do that. And so Ruth ends up being able to be married to, to Boaz, uh, a relative of her, of her husband. Uh, the way it closes is over here in Ruth chapter 4 and verse 13. It says, so Boaz, chapter 4 verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth and and uh, his wife. Took <laughs> no, and Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when she when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. 
And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without uh, a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. The child that was born is, is Od, uh, Odeb. Uh, let me get the right name here. Obed. Obed is the grandfather of King David. Ruth is the great-grandmother of King David. Naomi is the great-great-grandmother of King David. God is going to provide a redeemer for them. Boaz is the redeemer for Ruth. But Naomi is, uh, the, what, the, what is said by these ladies concerning Naomi after the, the child is born unto him, they say some things that are actually prophetic. Verse 15, And he, the child that's born, shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. And if you look at that prophetically, you realize you're not just talking about the seed of David himself, David. But you're going all the way down to Jesus Christ who is the kinsman redeemer the one who came to redeem his own, the nation of Israel, who is our redeemer as well. But, but he will be the restorer of thy life and the nourisher of thine old age. When he talks about her being, being restored to life and nourished, then the next thing is talks about the great love that Ruth had for Naomi and when it says that she is better than seven sons unto thee. And that is that, that she had filled in and done such blessings for you and now she's brought a seed into your family that your, your airship will go down and, and that, that airship is a, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of this is a picture of Christ who is the restorer of the life. He is the one who is the nourisher. He is the one who is the provider. He is the one who is the feeder. I, I see this and I, I realize when I read this, I see two things. I see number one, what it means to be a husband, what a wife needs in a husband, one who loves, provides, and protects. At the same time, I see that a husband can't always provide it. These three men died. And yet, the Lord filled in. The Lord was there. Amen? Amen. So that's what a husband is to be, is to love his wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That other part about giving himself for it, we said from Galatian, is to, he says that he might um, uh, deliver us from this present evil world. And that's what the other part that a husband must do. He must not only be a one who, who loves, provides, and protects, but he actually builds a shelter, a home, that inside that home there is deliverance from the world system out there, one that would protect from the society and as husbands, that's what we need to have, is a home where when you go home, you're safe. Where you go home, the world is locked away and you're protected from. And we have to build that kind of environment in, in, in order to help the, the people in the home, the wife and the children, to grow. A home is a fair haven. If you go back to Ephesians, it says something else. It says, I'll read 25 again, but we'll look in 26 now. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. When Jesus Christ gave himself for it, it says here that he might sanctify it and cleanse it. Now, sanctify means to be set apart. Well, in Leviticus chapter 24, um, where it talks there about the nation of Israel, that God set them apart from the Egypt and from all the rest unto himself. The idea of, of sanctify is to set apart unto himself. But when you set apart unto yourself, when God does it, what he does is he sets them apart as holy unto himself. When the Bible talks about you and I being sanctified through the Lord Jesus Christ, when he gave himself for us, it's that he might take us and not only separate us out from this present evil world, but to separate us, us out unto himself. We belong to him. 
And in the process of doing that, there's a cleansing that we are, we are holy unto him. Now, we know that in verse 26, we're reading there what Jesus Christ has done for us. But don't forget, Paul is not here talking doctrinally, telling us what Christ did for us. I think he expects us to know these things are true. He's saying these things in light of a husband's duty in the home. That we're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Now here's what Christ did for the church. Husbands, this is what you're doing to your wife. And so the first there is a husband is to sanctify his wife. That is, he is to separate her out from all other women in the world. And he separates her out, takes her out unto himself. That's in marriage. And she becomes his. And, and he takes her as holy, not with a W, with an H, holy unto himself. She's holy before him. And he separates her, her out from all other women, and, and in her eyes he is to be holy unto her. And, and, and he takes her unto himself. Therefore, when you start understanding what, what it means when it talks to the elders in First Timothy chapter 3, it says that a man should be, uh, especially an elder, should be the husband of one wife. Why? The one wife you choose out, she's different than all other women in the world. Why? You sanctified her. That woman you set apart out of all the women in the world, she's different. There's women, and then there's your wife. And there's a difference. You sanctify her out, and she's holy unto you. Your your love for her does what the love of Jesus Christ does for us. It covers a multitude of sin. That's why I said holy with an H. You look at her as holy. As, as your love for her would cover any flaws. And then in your relationship with her, and only your relationship with her is holy. Not like, not any other woman is, is holy unto yourself. Uh, and so the man sang, separ- sanctifies the wife as holy unto himself, and he's the only one uh, that, uh, she's the only one for him, and the only one that, is, that he can have relationships with in a holy manner before God. So he sanctifies her. But then the next verse says, and cleanses her. Now this one, it would be interesting for you who like to look a little closer at details. Uh, I see two kind of cleansings in the Bible. I see a cleansing that was took place by the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the verses that I love so much is in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, uh, where it reads this. It says, and, and from uh, greetings, it, it's sending the, the salutation. It says, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the faithful witness and the first begotten from the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, that's a cleansing, is it not? The Lord Jesus Christ not only sanctified us, but the reason we're set apart as holy, he cleansed us too. But you know, when I read that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, how did he cleanse me from my sins? Well, the verse says, by his own blood. He shed his blood to cleanse me. But when I'm reading over here in Ephesians chapter 5, and I understand uh, Revelation written to the seven churches of Asia, the Jewish uh, remnant there. But in in Ephesians chapter 5, it says this. It says that he might sanctify it and cleanse it by the washing of water by by the word. Not by the blood, but by the word. And when I start realizing that there's two different cleansings in the Bible, watch these. Come over with me to First First uh, Corinthians. Let me point these out to you. First Corinthians chapter six. It says in verse eleven, after it talks about all what we were. It says, and, ye, and such were some of you, but ye are washed. There it is, we're washed. But ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Well, the Spirit of God is what sanctifies you. So there's a, there's a verse of Scripture that tells me I am washed by Jesus Christ, what he's done for me. I am cleansed, I am justified, uh, and I am sanctified. And, and so these verses talk about that, that it's already done. That's something that's continuous to do. But if you turn with me then to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, there's another kind of cleansing here. Second Corinthians 7, verse 1 says, Having therefore these promises, already been blessed of God, 
Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So after, God, after we're sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansed, washed of our sins, then the Bible says now, having the promises, now that these are true, sanctify yourself, cleanse yourself uh, from the filthiness of the flesh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so there is a, a continual cleansing that goes on in your life, a practical cleansing, one we would call positional in Christ. We are holy, we are sanctified, we are washed. But then in our practical walk, we now are to cleanse ourselves in that practical walk. And how would you cleanse yourself? I think of Psalms 119, was it verse 9? Wherewithal will a young man cleanse his way? That's what I just asked. By taking heed to every word that will proceed out the mouth of God, according to thy word, how it says that in Psalms 119, verse 9. It's the word of God that cleanses us. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins so that we can be saved. That's when I had you turn to John chapter 10 in, in the scripture reading, and or Dan had you turn there and read in that scripture reading, in light, the shadow of the cross, it's the night before the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ goes unto his disciples, and, and after they ate communion, he now is going to take and wash their feet, and he comes to Peter, and Peter says, no, he, but he tells Peter, he says, Peter, he says, you don't understand right now, but later you'll understand. And even though Christ said, look, you don't know what's going on, just and what do you do when you don't know what? Just walk in faith, right? Well, not Peter. He said, no, Lord, don't, don't, you're not going to wash me. And Christ said, if I don't wash you, you're not going to be clean. But whoever I wash, they're every whit clean. And you know, there is, when you talk about washing, and you act, when it came to actually the washing of the feet, the word there is a word that, that describes uh, uh, partial cleansing. But then, when he said every whit clean, that's a cleansing that's a total cleansing. And that's why it says at the end of that verse, he said, He that is cleansed by Christ needeth only save to wash his feet. You only have to worry about a physical cleansing after that, because when Christ cleanses, you're, you're every whit clean. Now, he said all of that in light of going to the cross. He knew how he was going to cleanse them through his death on the cross. But then there's a, a cleansing that takes place after the cross where in our practical walk we're to be cleansed and it's the word of God that cleanses us then. Uh, come over in chap 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and look what Paul has in mind as we talk about not only positional cleansing, practical cleansing, but here's a presentation cleansing. Uh, whether the word cleansing fits it or not, you'll understand. It says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Verse 1, Would to God that you would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you unto one husband, that, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. For I, for I fear, lest by any means, uh, uh, any, any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have, we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Paul says, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I have joined you to one husband. You're joined with Jesus Christ. And, and he strives to present them as a chaste virgin unto Christ. Do you realize there's going to be a time that we're going to be presented to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a way in which before God the Father we're cleansed because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we are going to, we have a practical walk and we stand at the judgment seat of walk, we are going to be, at the judgment seat of Christ, we are going to be presented to Christ. And we can be presented either as, as a chaste virgin or I believe we can be ashamed when we stand before him because of our, for, because of our testimony walk. I believe there can be spot and wrinkle when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And, and if you remember what it says, we didn't read it, but Ephesians chapter 5, after it says that he might sanctify it and cleanse it uh, with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. My point to you, if you go back to Ephesians chapter, chapter 5 there, my point to you is that, that a husband is to 
sanctify, set apart his wife, and cleanse her. And if that second cleansing is the practical cleansing, then you realize what the husband's duty is supposed to do for his wife. He's supposed to sanctify her and cleanse her. Now, how does he cleanse her? It says, by the washing of the water by the word. Now, I've told you before how that washing of water confused me. But that first word, washing, you're talking about bathing. And it's, when you take a bath, that's how you get every whit clean, right? But now the washing of water, that is taking a bath in, in water for, for cleansing. And how do you do that? Well, it says, by the word. In other words, when I look at that verse, what it seems to be saying is, Husband, sanctify your wife, set her apart from the world as holy unto yourself, and cleanse her by bathing her with the Scriptures. Have a, have a spiritual relationship with your wife, not just a physical relationship. Have a spiritual relationship where you can take the worldliness that, that's been bombarded and, and block it away and then purify her within that home where there's not only, not only a fair haven from the world, but a church inside your home, uh, a worship place inside that home, a spiritual place inside that home where the Word of God is what's cleansing you and guiding you and purifying you. And as, as we are to be that way with Christ, so the husband's supposed to be that way in the, the, the provider in the home, a spiritual provider in the home, cleansing his wife by the word. Um, just in close, there's different things that hit my mind when I think about this. And, and by the way, the word wash there, sometimes you think of uh, all the Bible has in different words for baptism. And sometimes wash is one of them. When it talks about the Pharisees washing the cups or when it talks about in Hebrews 9 about diverse washing, that's the word baptizo. That's not the word here. This, this word had nothing to do with baptism at all. This word is lutron, which is, which is the word about being bathed as washed thoroughly clean. And it's the exact words that is used over and over again in John chapter 13. And that's why the scripture reading was there. So you'd understand that the cleansing that we're talking about is a spiritual cleansing by God, either through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ or a continual cleansing by the word of God. That's the cleansing that this verse is talking about. But sometimes you hear about, the man says, my home is my castle. You know, there's something wrong with that. When you read scripture and you read John chapter 13 and what he was trying to teach the disciples, that if you're going to be a servant of God, you're a servant to all. Then when a man comes home, the dog don't bring the newspaper and the kids don't bring the slippers and the wife don't bring the dinner. He comes home, it's time to go to work, not time to relax. He's been out in the world and keeping a testimony, hopefully, in the world. When he comes home, it's time to work on the home. Quite a responsibility in being a man. One that I'm afraid to stand in the judgment seat of Christ about. I had this cut out. I, you know, you know how I put those things in the bulletin. Here's one. Every time I went to put it in, I said, no, nah, I can't quite put that one in. It says, home is the place where you can take off your new shoes and put on your old manner. And you know, that's not true. That's absolutely, that's the worst thing you could ever do. You destroy that home, you put on your old, I guess it's a play on words, but manners is what I'm thinking. You go home and, and be yourself? No, oh, you better not be. What are we talking about? Spirit-filled husbands. You want to be Christ when you go home. You want to display Christ. You want to teach Christ. You want to talk Christ. You want to be the spiritual influence in the home. The only time you relax, men, is when you take off your shoes and you go to sleep at night. Other than that, you're a servant to all, because that's the place God's made us, in the home and in the world. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your grace. We thank you for your cleansing power. We thank you for your long-suffering and your patience with us, and we know that we are only vessels of earth. And we break and we're frail. And Father, we pray that that's when your glory comes through. Help us not to be content with our failures. Help us to be, be ever increasing and growing in, in, in our spiritual walk. And bless our homes, our Father. May men decide to be the spiritual leader that you've called us to be. So that home has an example to go out and start other homes the same influence. And we'll give you glory and you'll receive glory because it's all for you. 
Father, we pray that every person here does indeed know already the doctrine that Christ loved them and died for them, and that through faith in him they are sanctified and cleansed by his blood. And we, we pray that each person knows that and has made that decision to trust in him. Help us to walk now a sanctified walk. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Let's turn to number 45. We began the service with it. Let's just...